So um, I'll just do a brief introduction, um, just to let people join. I won't be thinking interesting, so don't worry. Um, so um, this uh, webinar is part of the uh, Archer training service that UPCC provide uh, for the Archer supercomputer service, but we're very keen to do things more general than just Archer, particularly as Archer is, is, is quite old and will soon be replaced. Um, so what um, Mark, uh, my colleague, is going to talk about today is programming GPUs with OpenMP. Obviously, GPUs have been uh, increasingly popular as a piece of hardware. They offer very, very good price performance um, and, and energy efficiency for large-scale numerical calculations. But the issue has always been programming them, um, not so much programming them per se, but programming them in a portable way. And uh, there are facilities in OpenMP, which is widely uh, used for more general shared memory programming and widely accepted standard, uh, which allow you to do um, GPU programming uh, within OpenMP. And so Mark is going to talk about that, um, and um, I'll pass it up to Mark right now. Okay, great. Thank you very much, David. So, yeah, let me introduce the uh, the accelerator support features in in OpenMP. Uh, and to begin with, I just wanted to note that uh, these are actually not intended to be GPU specific. So they were designed to be. Uh, able to be used for programming other attached devices. However, there aren't many other interesting devices out there at the moment. Um, I can uh, I uh, only aware of one other implementation, which is uh, Texas Instruments have an implementation for their DSP chips. Um, so the accelerator support in OpenMP is fully integrated into the rest of OpenMP. So the familiar. Um, API for for uh, multi-threaded programming on, on, on CPUs. Uh, it was introduced in version four of OpenMP, uh, but there was there have been significant revisions and extensions in versions 4.5 uh, and also in 5.0. Um, so 4.5 is what you'll find in most current implementations. 5.0 was announced at the end of last year, uh, and is uh, and versions of that are now beginning to appear in in real implementations. So the OpenMP accelerator support is uh, is similar to at least in spirit, um, but not the same as the OpenACC directive set. So OpenACC is an alternative standard for doing. Uh, the same kind of thing for offloading code to GPUs. Um, yeah, so OpenACC is, is more GPU specific. It was developed before OpenMP 4.0. Um, so, but in, in many ways, they, uh, they have converged in the sense that um, they, the specifications are different, but the functionality is pretty much the same. So anything you can do in OpenACC, you can now do, or at least when, when full OpenMP 5.0 implementations are available, you can do in OpenMP and vice versa. So the, uh, the functionality is, is more or less the same between OpenMP and, and, uh, and Open, OpenACC, but the, the, the syntax is, is different. Uh, in terms of what's out there at the moment, so uh, as far as I'm aware, there are the current usable implementations of OpenMP for GPUs are uh, the compilers from Cray, uh, IBM, uh, the LLVM Clang compilers, uh, and also uh, GCC, GNU, GNU compilers. Um, so uh, the first two of those, Cray and IBM, are obviously uh, proprietary compilers, which you need to pay good money for. Um, the LLVM and GCC implementations are freely available, uh, so you can, you know, you can install those, uh, or in principle, you can install those on your uh, on your own local system. Um, uh, the LLVM Clang build is not too awful. Um, I've had some success with that, and I'd be happy to share a recipe if anybody's interested. Please get in touch with me by email. Uh, the GCC one is notoriously awful, um, and I have uh, I have yet to, to manage to do that myself. Um, so you know, it's it, it in principle it works. In practice, getting getting the build process right is is just terrible. 
Okay, so looking a bit uh, in, into detail into the uh, into the uh, OpenMP implementation, so let's think about the model that's being supported here. Okay, so the OpenMP's device model is uh, is a host-centric model, so it assumes you have one host device, which would normally be the CPU, uh, and then you have multiple target devices attached to that of the same type. So it doesn't support uh, heterogeneous devices in, in, in current implementations. Um, so you know, a, a device is in the abstract is considered to be a logical execution engine with its own local storage. Uh, and OpenMP also talks about a data div uh, a device data environment. So ev every device has its own separate data environment. Uh, and, and that's associated with a, a with target data or target uh, target data region or a target region, which we'll we'll look at in more more detail. So the basic idea is that there are target constructs which control how data and code is offloaded to a, a device, uh, and data is mapped from the host data environment to a to a device data environment. So um, the names of variables are preserved. So variables have the same name in the, in the different environments, but they represent different instances of, of, of that storage. Okay, so the, the target region is the basic offloading construct in, in OpenMP. Um, so a target region defines a section of a program uh, in very much the same way as a parallel region defines a section of the program that would be executed by multiple threads in, in, in parallel. So, and the basic model is, you know, is, is very similar to parallel regions in the sense that the OpenMP program starts executing on the host. And then when a target region is, is encountered, the code that it contains is then executed on a device. And if we don't specify anything else, by default, the code inside the target region executes sequentially on the device. Okay, so the so the uh, the target region of itself does not express parallelism; it just expresses which device the contained code is going to execute on. At the end of the target region, the host thread. Uh, waits for the target region code to finish and then continues executing the next statement. So there's an implied synchronization between the device and the host at the end of the end of the target uh, target region. So the syntax just looks like what you might expect. It's hash pragma OMP target uh, followed by a structured block of code. So all my examples today are from the, the C interface. Um, there are uh, Fortran equivalents uh, for, for all of these. And anybody who's familiar with OpenMP uh, will find that there's no surprises in, 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 the, uh, in the Fortran interface. OK, so just to illustrate this uh, pictorially, so um, Imagine you have the program on, on the right, so if, uh, and which uh, contains a, a couple of target uh, directives with their, with their associated structured blocks. So the uh, program starts executing, the sequential part of the program executes on the host device. Then when we get to the target region, that executes on, 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 the, on, the, uh, on the device. Then we go back to this. And then when that ends, the uh, the host thread waits for the device code to finish, and then we're back in the sequential part of the program, executing on the host again. And then we can have as many target regions as we like uh, within the lifetime of the of the code. Okay. So before we come to parallelism on the device, I want to talk about the way that data is handled. So the host and the device have separate memory spaces. Uh, and in order to access data inside the target, target region, it must be mapped to the device. And the mapped data 
must not be accessed by the host until the target region has completed. Okay, so the, the model essentially bans you from doing from operating on the on the on the data in two different places at, at, at the same time. So the default behavior in uh, in version 4.5 is that any any scalars referenced in the target construct are treated as uh, uh, in the same, as, as, as first private. What that means is that what you're actually getting is you're getting a new copy created on the device, uh, and then that'll be the initialized with the value that that, uh, that that scalar had on the host. Uh, and static arrays are copied to the device on entry uh, and back to the host on, on exit. So, so those type of variables are, are taken care of for you automatically with the default, default behavior. However, for other, other types of data and uh, if, you want other, if you want other behavior, then more control is available by the map clause on the target construct. So, uh, so this like, looks like hash pragma OMP target and then map clause with a map type uh, and then a list of variables. So the map type can be one of the following, okay? So it can be two, which means copy the data to the device on entry to the, to the region. It can be from, then it says copy the data back to the host on exit from the region. Uh, and then there's two from, which is just the combination of the first two. So copy the data both to the device on entry and back again on exit. Uh, and then there's the, the fourth option is alloc. Uh, and what that does is it just allocates an uninitialized copy on the device, but doesn't actually copy any values from the host. So it just gives you a, a, a scratch copy of that uh, uh, of that variable on the device uh, and doesn't initialize. So it's, it's then up to you to, to put some initialized values on that in the, in the uh, device code. Okay, so it's a little example here. Okay, so suppose we have a, a loop here that uh, does, does this, um, adds two vectors together and then and then forms the forms the sum of the values so if we want to offload that onto the device we can say hash pragma omp target uh, and then can say map to bnc for the arrays as we, we we need to map we need the values on the device uh, from the host but we they're read only so we don't need them back it we're not going to modify those so they don't need to come back again and, and then for for sum, then so we in that case we need to say map to from because we need both the initial value of sum to be copied to the device. It's then added to on the device, and then uh, at the end of the target region, the, the final value is copied back to the host again. So that's great. So that it, so that uh, illustrates the the way that the, uh, the data is handled. But just to emphasize, that is uh, that this this example will will give you sequential execution of that loop on the device. So that in, in itself is is not very useful. So I just wanted to make the point that that is that is offloading the, that code to the device, but it is not getting any parallelism on the device. And we'll come back and see how that how that can be done. Okay. So Mark, this question came in. I don't know if you saw it. Um, do you see what? Uh, okay. Is target asking, a keyword. Target yes. Target, target, target is a keyword. Um, uh, target is a keyword. If you have multiple devices, then you can specify which device you want the region to run on. Um, and the uh, the that's basically the devices are just numbered starting from zero. Okay, thank you. And 
Yeah, dynamically allocate data. Okay, so there's a subtlety here. Uh, if we have uh, if we have dynamically allocated data, then in the map clause we need to specify the number of elements to be copied. Um, it's so this is the uh, usual problem is that the uh, if all, essentially all your all the compiler can see is is a, is a pointer to to some memory. Uh, and it doesn't know how big that piece of memory is that you that you want to, uh, want to move around. So you have to tell it how many elements to move. Okay. So, for example, in this case, if uh, you know, if I'd um, mallocked in a, uh, a, an, a, an array of of, of ints uh, and stored a pointer to that in in B, then if I want to uh, if I want to map that uh, that piece of data onto the device. Then I have to use this uh, this subarray type syntax um, uh, to specify the the start point uh, and the and the extent. Okay, um, so the start point is there because that allows you to specify a part of the array that's not starting at the uh, at the zeroth element. So in the second example here, you, you can say, okay, uh, map to B. Uh, 10 colon 3 so that starts starts at uh, starts at element 10 and, and maps three elements um, something that's uh, for Fortran programmers to note here okay uh, so if you're if you're familiar with Fortran subarray syntax which is how the Fortran interface for this for the map clause works then the syntax is different from the C and C++ one so C and C++, the, the syntax is start colon length, whereas in Fortran, it's uh, start colon end. Um, so that's kind of slightly awkward. But as long as you're working in one or other of the languages and, don't, and uh, uh, if you switch from one to the other, you need to remember that that's different. Okay, so it turns out that for uh, for performance reasons, keeping data on the device as much as possible is 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 important. As um, you know, for a lot of current hardware, so which again is largely thinking about GPUs here, moving data between the host and device is, is expensive. Um, so we'd like to avoid mapping data on in every target region. If we if we can keep it on the device between target regions, okay. So if nothing's going to happen to that piece of data between target regions, we would like it to stay on on the device and not get copied to the host and back again. So there's a there's a couple of other constructs that help us do this. So there's the target data constructs which just map data and don't offload any code. Uh, and then there are target update constructs, which just copy values between carb between target constructs. Okay, so you can update in either do an update in in either direction. Okay. So, for example, uh, what we could uh, so an example we could look at here is uh, okay. So. Suppose we have some uh, a loop. So this is the uh, uh, which, so we're repeating some piece of calculation. So it could be time steps, could be could be some something like that. Uh, and each each iteration of that loop contains a target uh, region, and that's inside that target region. We're going to do something with with uh, with ar arrays A and B, um, but in between we're going to do something on the host, which does not involve A and B. So we'd like to be able to keep those arrays on the device uh, while all those target regions are, are running. Um, so the way we could do that is we could say, OK, um, uh, we would surround that uh, loop with target enter and target exit constructs. So to begin with, we have a target enter data construct. Uh, which just which maps A and B from the host to the device, 
Uh, and then after the loop, we have a target exit data, which uh, in this case, it just maps B back again. Okay, so um, I'm assuming here that B, is, B has been modified on, on the device, but A has not, so that, the, uh, so that we uh, don't care about the getting the values of A back, but we do want the values of B back eventually after all the target regions have executed. Um, okay, a few questions coming in. Yeah. Um, the, about the GCC implementation. Uh, the GCC implementation is fine if you can, if you can actually build the thing. <laughs> So the, the, the difficulty is that it, it just seems to be extremely, the, the build process, you have to basically reinstall uh, GCC from scratch with the extra add-ons for the, uh, for the uh, device, drive, uh, device driving. Um, and it, the process seems to be really fragile. Okay, and uh, so on, on the next slide, we've got something uh, a little bit more complicated. So um, just to, to illustrate the updates. So again, here we could have the same target enter data and target exit data. Um, but then suppose we have two target, target regions and in between those, we want to uh, modify one element of array, on, uh, of array A on the host. Okay, so we have a uh, first target region which uh, does stuff with A and B, and then we can do an update from uh, and just say uh, A0 here, okay, and then back again, okay. So that will copy A0, uh, just, the, just the zeroth element of, of A back to the host. We can modify that on the host and then do the update to, to, to push that back to the device again. Uh, and then execute the, the, the second target region. Um, so that allows you the sort of flexibility to do, uh, up, to do updates in either direction um, in between target regions. Okay, so that's, uh, that's basically how, the, uh, how all the data movement works. So let's now think about parallelism on, on the device. Um, so in principle, we can use all the normal OpenMP constructs inside a target region to create and use threads on the device. So we can do parallel regions, work sharing, synchronization, tasks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, but that is dependent on the nature of the device and whether those whether that full OpenMP model is, is supported. GPUs are not able oh, to sorry support. Sorry to interrupt. There's just a quick question. Yeah, it's quick, sure. It's probably relevant here. Sorry to interrupt. It's just to okay. clarify something from Joan. Yeah. From is device to host. That's right. Yeah. And two is, yeah. So, yeah, two is host to device, from is device to host. Yeah, so GPUs are, GPUs are not able to support a full threading model outside of a single stream multiprocessor. So a GPU consists of, um, many single uh, many single stream multiprocessors, um, uh, each of which can run can run multiple threads. So uh, why is that? Well, because essentially you have no mechanisms for synchronizing or doing memory fences between uh, SMs. They, each SM has its own level to these days on modern GPUs. Uh, each, each SM has its own level one cache. 
uh, and there is no coherency between them. So what, what will happen is that if you have a parallel region inside a target region, that will only execute on one of the SMs. So it'll work, but it'll leave most of the cores on your GPU idle. And you know, so um, you, if you're familiar with CUDA, then you know you face the same problems there. Okay, you can in CUDA you can only synchronize threads inside a thread block and not between thread blocks, uh, and and that's you know the, that's a reflection of the same underlying restrictions of the, of the hardware. Okay, so go back to an example. So you could uh, with uh, off, offloading this this loop, then uh, you could just try uh, parallelizing that loop in the regular way that you would do in OpenMP. So you could just say, uh, inside the target region, you would have hash pragma OMP parallel four uh, uh, with the with the redu reduction operation on on the sum variable. So in principle, on some devices that might work fine, right? But on, on GPUs, that's uh, that the parallelism is restricted to within one SM, which is probably not much use to anybody. So in order to be able to cope with GPU architectures, um, there is an additional uh, notion, additional construct in, in, inside OpenMP called the Teams construct. Uh, and what this does is essentially creates multiple master threads executing inside a target region and then each master thread can in turn spawn its own team of threads with a parallel region and this restriction here is that threads in different teams cannot synchronize with each other okay so all your OpenMP synchronization constructs like barriers critical regions locks atomics etc only apply to the threads within a team and you can uh, there are utility routines so you can set the number of teams you can query the current team id query the number of teams in the same sort of way as you uh, um, set and, and query the the numbers of threads uh, in regular cpu open mp programming so the model looks like this so what you have is you have a, a, a as we look at the, the code on the right here, you have a, a, a target construct inside that you have a teams construct, and then inside that you have a regular old parallel region. So what happens is that when the target construct executes, the teams construct will create a bunch of teams so each where each team has its own master thread and then in turn each team creates a separate parallel region with threads that that execute on uh, inside that team And for convenience, um, because uh, I, you know, as ever, uh, loops are the main source of parallelism in most applications, and especially so for GPUs, then if we offload a parallel loop to the device, we'd like to be able to distribute the iterations of the across the teams, as well as across the threads within the teams. So there's a, there's a, there's a construct that, that uh, can be used to do this called, called distribute. So this is very much like the for construct for parallelizing loops, um, uh, and it assigns iterations of the following loop to different teams. Uh, and it in turn also has a, 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 an equivalent of the schedule clause. So in this case, it's called disk schedule, um, but, you, but this is restricted. Okay, so unlike the schedule clause for the for construct, where you can specify um, dynamic schedule so you've got dynamic and guided um, it, with disk schedule you or the only uh, schedule kind you can have is is static with an optional chunk size so you, the only types of uh, of scheduling you can have are a block schedule or, or a block size click schedule so question here is the number of teams determined Mark, by the device itself the same question that i had yeah yeah um, so 
Implementations tend to choose a sensible default for the number of teams depending on the hardware, but you can, if you want to override that, you can specify it. So yeah, so typically there's a, there's a, you know, most implementations will typically match the number of teams to the number of SMs on the GPU by default, um, but you can you can change that if you want to. So Mark, I had a similar question, which was OpenACC had a hierarchy of, I can't remember what they were, vector, worker, or uh, something or other. Is, is, there a, is there a natural mapping between teams and, and some concept in OpenACC, or is, am I misunderstanding? Yes, there is, yes. Um, as I say, again, the, I, I don't gangs remember the exact, thing, yes, yeah. gangs, and, gangs and workers, so yes. There is some, okay. that's a team, teams and then threads within a team is, is more or less the same idea there. Okay, thanks. Okay, so finally, we can get something that will actually do something useful with this, um, with this example, okay? So you end up with this ludicrously long directive in order so, and um, there are uh, there are a whole bunch of of combined directives here. You so you don't have to write a whole stack of them. You can all put it on on one line. Um, so if you want to if you want to offload this loop to a GPU and parallelize it across SMs and threads within an SM, then that's what you have to do. Hash pragma OMP target teams distribute parallel four, uh, and then the map clauses, uh, and then the reduction clause. So you can jam everything, jam everything together, which kind of looks a bit horrible, really. So Mark, David is asking if you have teams greater than number of physical SMs. Is there some load? Is there some sort of task farming done there, or are the other are the extra ones just ignored? Um, so, if the number of teams is bigger than your SMs, then yes, I think they probably do queue up. And if there's if it's smaller, then yes, you will get some idle SMs. Um, so That's probably, strictly speaking, that's probably an implementation issue rather than a, um, rather than part of the specification, because the specification doesn't assume anything very much about the hardware. As an, you know, has a has a fairly abstract model of the hardware, so you won't you won't see any. If you look at the OpenMP specification, you won't see anything about GPU hardware in there. But this does seem to be a way to sort of do load balancing in some sense. You said you couldn't, there was no dynamic schedule, but if you specify more teams, you might hope that it's a first come, first served, and you might get some load balancing. You might. Okay. Or maybe that's not. Okay. Mm, might you might, you might, or you might just get some cyclic assignment. I don't know. It's a good question, and I'm not absolutely sure of what what implementations will do. I guess the most important thing is that they'll execute. I guess, you know, they will execute, but whether it's performance optimal is, is, is a different yes. question, I guess. Um, uh, but you have to mark them up. Okay, essentially you have to specify if you want to call, uh, if, you, if you're going to call a function inside, inside a target region, you have to tell the compiler uh, to compile a version of that that can be called on the device. Uh, and that's what declare, declare target does. Okay, so basically if you, uh, if you wrap your function prototypes inside a uh, declare target, uh, an end declare target block, then the compiler knows that you're going to call myfunc uh, on the device and it will compile a version for you uh, for the for the device as well as for the host
Okay. Yeah. So back to an earlier question. Yes. So there's a there's a device clause um, uh, which allows on the target uh, directive, which allows you to specify which which device to offload to. Um, so it just takes an int integer parameter. Uh, the device numbering is implementation dependent, but you'd hope that they start from zero and it's sequential. But the, you don't have any guarantees. It's, it's kind of the same with like CPU numbering that you know you kind of hope it's sensible, but you don't actually really ever know. Another. Um, Another potential feature is that you can do is you know to so say by as I said at the beginning to by by default the host thread blocks until the target region is completed, um, but you can you can change that behavior by adding a no wait clause to the target. Um, so in this case, the target region actually becomes a task. So you can use task synchronization constructs like task wait to to wait for the for completion. And so they 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 behave as though they were enclosed in a in a like as though they were enclosed in a task construct. Um, but then you you uh, you have to take you know uh, care to make sure that the host doesn't access the map data until the target region has been completed. Okay, so just to finish off, think of a little bit about some performance issues. I'm not really going to go into into any any great depth here. Um, so as I mentioned before, the transferring data between host and device is expensive, uh, and to get any sort of performance, you really need to minimise that as much as possible. Um, so you know, don't transfer anything that you're not going to use, and keep data on the device as far as possible using target data regions. Um, so another feature of GPUs is that typically they need lots of threads to work efficiently. Um, uh, so you may even need, you know, so unlike CPUs, it's often advantageous to have more uh, software threads than you have physical hardware threads available. Um, so that means you need to, you know, and so that might mean, you know, exposing a thousand threads worth of parallelism for a, for a GPU or more than a thousand. So you need to expose a lot of parallelism. Um, so typically, you know, it's sort of a one or two orders of magnitude more than what you need to do for the for the C, for the CPU. Um, so that can mean you can easily run into situations where, you know, if you have nested loops then just parallelizing the outer loop, which is what you would naturally tend to do for uh, OpenMP on a CPU, you just might not have enough parallelism there. Um, so you can use the, so the, you know, if you have uh, nested loops, then the collapse clause becomes useful here so that you can parallelize two or more loops in the nest uh, and not just the outermost, outermost one. Okay, uh, and then there are issues relating to to, to memory layout. Okay, so uh, and unfortunately for you know because of the nature of GPUs, it's you know, things are the opposite way around for for them for CPUs. Okay, so you know, one of the important considerations is you know for CPUs, if you have different threads accessing neighboring words in memory, that tends to be bad. Um, so, because there's a, a risk of, of false sharing, you uh, you you are uh, unnecessarily invoking the hardware cache coherency mechanism. Um, it's okay if it's if 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 everything is just reads, but if uh, if uh, if uh, one or more threads is uh, are writing, then you will get a lot of cache invalidations, and the 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 uh, performance tends to be bad. In contrast, for GPUs, having different threads accessing neighboring words in memory tends to be good um, because there's a, a mechanism which is co called coalesced load and stores uh, get, gets in, uh, kicked in at the hardware level if, if you have that kind of memory access pattern. 
Um, so basically, if you have have um, multiple threads inside an SM uh, accessing uh, neighboring words in memory, you, you basically the hardware will generate a single load or store for uh, for what effectively looks like a vector of uh, of values, um, which can improve performance. So this leads you to, you know, this kind of consideration can lead you to a problem because if you have data structures which are being used on both CPU and the GPU, then you have, um, you, you, you know, you may want to, ex you may want to end up, ex it may be worth explicitly changing the layout. Okay, so, you know, that might mean transposing multi-dimensional arrays before mapping to the GPU. Um, you might not have to do that, so you might be able to re you know to organize your uh, memory accesses by interchanging loops, for example, so that you have a different loop that's uh, accessing the uh, the contiguous that's contiguous memory. Um, so you know so which is uh, parallel in one case and sequential in the other. Uh, or you can use you know you can use the schedule clause to to control that. So you know whereas on uh, you know, the Using a, a a static schedule with a with a block size of one may be advantageous on the GPU because that then then you would end up you might you know use that to arrange for different threads to access neighboring words in a neighboring elements of an array, which might be good um, even though there's no you know so that can be a, um, a reason for using that kind of schedule even though there's no load balance problem. It can uh, it can help you organize the uh, the right memory access patterns. Okay, so um, that's uh, that's the end of uh, of, of uh, what I of the material that I had for today. I'd be very happy to uh, take any any more questions. So thanks a lot, Mark. Um, I think it's best if people type their questions in the incoming audio comes. Uh, you can try audio if you want, but it's often best if we do do it by chat. It says several people are typing. <laughs> Question that came through from David first, I think. Okay, so um, regarding performance, when is code transferred to the GPU? Um, good question. Uh, basically, it's probably done at program startup, and you don't care. Okay, so the cost of cost of transferring code is unimportant. So, are there any non-GPU devices that could be accidentally used? Um, I guess, in principle, yes. Um, you would probably the OpenMP the compiler would probably have to give you some way. If you had a heterogeneous system, the compiler would have to give you some. Um, some mechanism for specifying which type of device you were you were using. Okay, uh, compiling OpenMP GPU programs using GCC. Um, so the the there's nothing special about the compilation. Okay, so you just just. Um, um, or is there? Hang on. For GCC, yes, you probably need some additional flags as well as the uh, as well as the minus f open MP flag. Um, can't remember off the top of my head what you need to do. Um, okay. Um, Fortran implementation is well developed as the C C plus plus implementations. Yes, as far as I know. Yes. So Fortran compilers supporting, I think it's it's basically the same list, okay? Um, Cray, IBM, uh, LLVM, so it'll be Flang rather than Clang and, and uh, G Fortran rather than GCC. So 
is there a mechanism to to interface to to CUDA? Um, so can you can you also have can you also have CUDA in the same in the same code? Um, yes, you. There is some support for that. There are you. Uh, there is now support in OpenMP for device pointers. So there is uh, 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 again, it's it's implementation dependent, but there um, uh, you can there is you can have access to device pointers in OpenMP, which helps. Yeah. Okay, uh, where did I get to? Paul, hi. And pointers for um, pointers for performance comparisons. Um, there's not a lot out there. Um, some, I would, first place might be to look would be uh, Simon McIntosh Smith's group at Bristol have done quite a lot of work on this kind of thing. The next question, reporting to CPU code to GPU, what kind of metrics might you focus on apart from apart from runtime? Uh, any particular tools? Um, yeah, so if you're uh, if you're on a, Nvidia devices, which is you know likely story at the uh, you know in current hardware, then uh, the the Nvidia profile is really helpful um, because it tells you about the you know it tells you how much particular things like how much time you're spending transferring data. So and it and it's really easy to use as well. Um, so I can def definitely recommend that. So the question is, will the code be executed in the CPU if there's no compatible GPU, will it crash? Um, it will execute on the CPU. Yeah, should do. That's probably, again, one of those implementation dependent things, but So um, happy to take any more questions if there are any more. Um, that's been a lot of interesting questions. Um, does anyone have anything else they'd last, like to ask? Well, as I said, this session has been recorded and will be up on the web later. And um, we try and transcribe the questions, so they should be there as well. But um, this is your chance if you had any other final questions for Mark about, uh, about OpenMP and GPUs. So Harvey is typing. You might just say that. So I think it looks like um, so I'm glad the technology went well. Um, our uh, training admin expert Claire was uh, on having a holiday as uh, she's glad she is having a break. But and it was left to me to and Mark to cope with the technology. But we seem to have managed to get working despite. Yay! This, uh, <laughs> about Claire and I hope you enjoyed that. I find it uh, very interesting, and very useful. And um, as I said, uh, uh, the, the material will go up on the web uh, for later, so you'll have access to this in the future. So thanks yeah. for joining. That was a great audience, about 30 people at yeah. the That's really glad there was so much interest. And thanks again, Mark. Thanks for such an interesting presentation. You're welcome. And uh, very, very happy to uh, take questions. You know, if you've got any follow-up questions, please, uh, please feel free to drop me an email. Yes, so as yes, Mark said, feel free to, if you, something occurs to you after the, after the session, uh, send a question in to Mark, um, or uh, if, you, if you can't find Mark's email address, you could try the Archer help desk, where I'm sure Mark's happy to take them, happy to take yeah, that sure. away. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks very much, everybody. That was great.